Welcome to the Kawartha Small Business Podcast, where we believe the Kawarthas can be the most thriving region in Canada for small business. I'm Brian Rump from Profit Coach. And I'm Matt Garrity from Matty G Digital. And before we get started, head over to Kawartha Small Business Podcast.ca slash checklist and download Matt and Brian's marketing checklist for Kawartha Small Businesses. All right, Matt, we are hitting it hard today and we are talking about fraud. Um, and breaking down some of the ways people are probably committing fraud in their small business. So um, people just l- are going to love me for being like, you're committing fraud. <laughs> um, but I thought it would be fun to pack in a whole episode of uh, common fraud people are doing. So what are, you, what are your initial thoughts? Yeah, I was wondering where you wanted to go with this. I was wondering if you were calling me a fraud or if you were going to be accusing me of fraud, then it sounds like the latter. So hit me up. Tell me how <laughs> I am awesome. personally committing fraud. All right. Well, we won't tell you how you are because um, I think I might, might have told you some of those in the past of uh, literal legal fraud. Um, I think what I'm talking about, though, is ways people are maybe breaking laws they don't know about, um, doing things that they think, oh, this is all right, but really it's it's not. Um, not necessarily sort of like imposter syndrome type fraud, like, oh, you're a fraud, you're not a real business owner. Uh, that's a whole other, I think, conversation. Um, and anyone who owns a business is a real business owner. Um, so we'll go to bed. But I think, uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, I was in finances, the banks. I think about all the, um, I call it mild mortgage fraud, although it's not necessarily mild, but just the series of sort of rules that get bent all the time. Uh, Tricks people try with their taxes that, you know, are definitely fraud if you get caught knowingly doing it. there's a lot with sort of employment standards that I would sort of categorize broadly under that, that uh, I thought would be a beneficial discussion. Yeah. I was wondering now if when you're talking about things that fraud that people are committing or business owners, like, is it a accounting thing or just in general, I assume it's mostly an accounting thing. Um, I remember talking to a lawyer that I worked with who was, extremely mad, not at me, but while she was talking with me about a new accountant bookkeeper that she had just hired. And the way she phrased it was like, well, you know how you hire these accountant bookkeepers so they can like help you save money and find all the loopholes. And in my head, I was like, I don't really think that that's what they're there for. (laughs) That seemed like such an outrageous thought. And then it made me actually think, I bet you that conversation comes up a lot more with accounts and bookkeepers than I would imagine. Oh, I think so. I've had, I mean, I full disclosure, you know, work with Greg Evans Professional Corporation. Um, I am not an accountant. Um, in my past working uh, with the uh, bank and commercial lending, I've you know, dealt with lots of businesses, lots of accountants. Um, And I've seen the spectrum. And I think one of the things people don't realize just generally is different levels of assurance. So if you want books that are completely free of sort of errors and frauds, you know, that's a full audit, which for most small businesses is just extremely expensive and they're not probably not going to do it. Um, Businesses just get into doing it though. And owners do pay for that because they're trying to avoid things Mm. like fraud or employee theft, or they want things to be sort of done properly with a level of sort of third party insurance assurance to be able to um, come up with that. Um, In general, I think a lot of small businesses will bounce around to bookkeepers or they'll find bookkeepers who they sort of see as magicians Sometimes they're like, oh, well, the bookkeeper did that. Uh, and, and I take exception to it because it, it shows a lack of knowledge about sort of your own finances. Um, I would never, ever ha- own a business and just 
trust my finances to magic, I guess, um, or somebody sort of pulling some, uh, some tricks. Um, and I think sometimes it's people just aren't competent, right? So they don't really know what they're doing or we don't have that looming, you know, no one's looking over your shoulder with a checklist, making sure you do things right and legally. So like if you make a little mistake here or a little keying error over there, it's easy to say, oh, sorry, I made a mistake there. You know, mistakes happen. Um, but I think it does become a, a pattern, you know, and ends up being fraud and people aren't reporting their incomes properly or they're inflating expenses or they just don't know what's going on in their, in their business finances. Well, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be an accountant bookkeeper. I assume that the CRA and the tax people are changing rules. Is it regularly? Oh, and that's the other caveat is we're in a terrible system for clarity. Mm. Like the rules change all the time. They cherry pick the rules that they might, you might see suddenly they're looking at stuff. They typically go for easy stuff. And, and, you know, that's another conversation is how CRA manages some of those rules, because often what you'll see is rich people getting away with insane amounts of sort of fraud, but then they'll focus on, you know, oh, this type of business is underreporting X, and then they'll probably spend more money finding it than what they actually collected penalties. Um, so that, you know, I will agree that it is is unfair. It's hard to navigate all of the rules. Um, but that being said, a lot of people, that's not really what's happening. It's like, oh, I misunderstood this rule. It's I didn't even bother looking at that rule or trying to figure out that rule. Yeah, and it's hard enough for accountants and bookkeepers to keep up. I can't imagine people that try to do their taxes on their own or I don't know if there are, are there a lot of people that try to do their business taxes, corporation taxes, or are there a lot of sole proprietors even that try to do their own taxes? Oh, I think a lot of people try to do their own um, and it's taxes. I think it's also just most people don't know the fundamentals of bookkeeping. Um, and I have that conversation with some good bookkeepers sometimes is they have to you know, some of our programs make it so easy to track some things that we sometimes forget about, oh, it's this is double entry or this should be here, not just, you know, tracked here. Um, so people just, when you don't know that, you can sort of make stuff up. Um, and s sometimes you get, you know, you make a mistake and then if you're in a software and it shows your tax liability or something going down, it's like, oh, well, I'll just make it look like that because now the number I have to pay is lower and I like that. So you just go move on with it. Why wouldn't people want that number to be lower? Like why wouldn't businesses want that number to be lower? Well, I think well, in general, people are averse to paying taxes and they don't want to. Usually it's because they don't have the cash. And the fundamental reason is they're not, their business isn't built for profit. It's not built to be a business. They're scrambling all the time. So they get, you know, you should, as a business owner, never ever be surprised by a tax bill. Like, and people get surprised all the time. They're like, what? I owe, you know, this much, or I collected this much in HST and, I don't have that kind of money around and you, really you should. So then they look for ways of, okay, how do I reduce that? Or how do I, uh, you know, move some money off books a little bit, which is really common with sole proprietors, um, some corporations, you know, as a banker, I would have people want to borrow loans. And I remember one, they wanted to borrow $700,000 and you go there and they've got like three luxury cars, beautiful facility. And it's like, oh, here's our financials. We had, a, you know, $50,000 in revenue last year and a loss of $10,000. And it, it makes no sense because 
even for what they were selling, their minimum sale price would have been like two grand. And it's like, you're telling me you employ 10 people and you had 30 customers all last year and you have all of this stuff. And it's like, that's an egregious, like, um, I think, uh, version. But until you get caught, you know, no one's sort of on you all the time for that stuff. Um, so I think it's, you know, just things like that that people do. They will inflate expenses sometimes they'll make up expenses without having like any receipts for that um, there's sort of all sorts of things that you see all the time but the commonality of most of those businesses are people who aren't really that profitable they're getting by they're not building a sustainable built business they're definitely not building a business that has value someone else would pay for um, and you see that too, where they're like, oh, I want to sell my business. And uh, someone comes and looks at the book and his books and it's like, well, you lose $40,000 every year. You know, how, no one's going to pay you to lose money like, <laughs> like that. So it doesn't hurt, help you in the long run. Um, and I think that's another, we've, we've talked a bit about taxes before, but people will do things in the short term to try to you know, do gymnastics so they don't make any money. But then when they have an opportunity and they want to borrow from the bank, right? it's like, you know, they're, you know, they're not making anything, right? Or they want to buy a house personally. And it's like, well, I'm sorry, you can't buy a house if you make negative $10,000 every year, um, which is just, you know, it all goes back to like, why not just build a good profitable business? Yeah, and like not to just double up on almost exactly what you said, but thinking about how people are sh so short-sighted with, okay, I don't want to spend $15,000 on taxes or $20,000 on taxes. I only want to spend 15 or 10. So they're going to save themselves five grand. That's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, but short term saving five grand and then turning around when you have another need to borrow money, whether it's like a new business or um, a new project or for whatever reason you need to borrow money. Now you're reporting less income that you're not going to be able to get that extra money for that capital. Or yeah, like you're trying to buy a home or whatever else you're trying to achieve. The banks want to see how much money you have. And you're toast if you've been messing around with your books for a couple of years and you're not going to get what you want. It's, it's, it's so short-sighted, um, sighted. And it, it's um, maybe because I've been there, um, not the fraud part, I don't think, but the idea of having to borrow money and recognizing, well, it's thank goodness I was properly reporting on my income this last couple of years because I have a proper accountant and bookkeeper. And because of that, like I had proper books and everything in place that they gave me a lot of money, in my opinion, subjectively, in what I thought was a very short amount of consideration. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe how quickly that was approved, but that's a different story. And like me and you know the bit more of the background and how much I want to say we, but I want it, it was you that prepared a lot of information to send over to BDC. Um, and that's why it all got approved and everything was like in a neat little tidy package. But I remember asking Heather on the call, like two days after it was approved, like they t spent two days looking at it. So like, do you have any questions? I mostly was like, why are you doing this? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. This is almost <laughs> too easy. <laughs> well, and that's the point of having a, a good business. And that's, you know, the root of some of my frustration is you watch people, I think adopt these paradigms or, you know, they think, Oh, I don't want to pay tax or they think that tax strategy means paying nothing versus tax strategy, which is more for people who are, you know, they're earning hundreds and thousands of dollars in profit. And yeah, there's some things that you can do that defer some of that um, taxation, how you maybe recognize your revenue or how you structure your companies to 
you know, where that profit goes and all of these sort of shave little bits of tax off and it adds up, right? When you're talking in the hundreds of thousands of, of profit, but it's not for people who are just trying to get by, just trying to, um, you know, build that business or borrow that, you know, money for that business investment project. And, you know, your project is a just a great example. And I was talking with Heather from BDC actually last week um, on a couple of other projects and just, you know, the short sightedness bothers them as well because they're trying to help people grow their business, access capital, access it at a reasonable interest rate. And when people do some things that are sometimes just completely unnecessary, like it prevents them from being able to do that. Like, you know, if you want to buy a piece of equipment or you want to build mm. like a, a new facility that's going to help yeah. make you a million dollars over 10 years, but you can't do that because of, you know, shaving off a couple thousand here and there or that, you know, and in a way that's malicious or sort of malicious, I think, you know, people have a vision of, you know, the hardcore fraud, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and his uh, check forging uh, from that movie. <laughs> but, you know, people might not be doing that. You know, you might not be forging expenses, um, but, you know, you, you do some things that just aren't, aren't proper and they're going to hurt you in the long run. Yeah, and it almost seems like you're being harsh with the term fraud. Why are you being so harsh? Well, I, I, I'm just trying to label it for what it is. <laughs> and, the, you know, it comes back for me, I think, you know, when I worked at the bank, there was people who would be like, oh, it's the computer says it. And sort of like what you put in the computer, it makes a decision. So it's <laughs> like, well, if I just, you know, I would work with, you know, I, I don't want to. But no one's probably going to listen to this and they're probably not going to sue me. Say but their names. Like, oh. Say their names. Who yeah. committed fraud? You know, if uh, I, I would see it all the time, someone would come in, they'd have like 10 credit cards and I'd be like, there's no way you can get a mortgage. And then boom, they get a mortgage from going to someone else. Yeah. And it's like, all they did was not enter any of that in. And then if the computer didn't recognize, oh, there's some undeclared debt here. Like you just, you, you know, you slide one by just, and then you can put it off easily as like sort of ignorance. Um, there was also a period of time, which was so stupid where you didn't have to de like verify your income if you were self-employed. So you could walk Beautiful. in and be like, hey, Sign me up. I make, I make 700 grand a year. Can I have a mortgage? And they would like pop that in and be like, all right, like nice, <laughs> nice work. Um, and when all they would that? ask for, it was a Stephen Harper thing. Mm. And it was um, for a while with CMHC, you could do 40-year um, mortgages. And there was a window where that you didn't have to verify self-employed income. You just had to have a notice of assessment that proved you didn't owe back taxes. So as okay. long as you actually filed your taxes and showing that you were in sort of crazy debt to the government, then you could basically say whatever you wanted, which I think the, the spirit of that was more like, oh, it's hard to like know or, you know, oh, I'm using some tax tricks to make my income, you know, look like 50,000 instead of, you know, 60, which is maybe more reasonable, but yeah, but the reality was people could just enter in whatever they wanted, right? So you would s see this lending. And I think you see it a lot in, in mortgages, in lending, um, people not doing full due diligence. Um, I was always, I liked doing that and like finding, you know, let's just put it on paper. Like what are all your assets and what are all your debts? And to be fair, most people don't know, which is weird. Like if you're like, oh, tell me all the credit cards you have, people will forget one and, or, you know, they'll forget one that has like, they have like 20 grand on. It's like, oh, I forgot about that one. Um, I which bet seems you did, crazy, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it happens all the time. Oh, well, I think you, you know, if you get into like crazy debt like that, 
usually you're not remembering those things. You're just taking whatever's there, reacting to what's coming after you. So when you do that, put it all on paper, it's like there's no way you should be borrowing for, say, a mortgage or something like that. But somebody else is going to, you know, just happen to take a quick application, you know, run some numbers into the computer and then hope nobody says, oh, let's look deeper at this because they're dealing with such high volumes of applications. They don't have enough people to do thorough looks all the time. So they just do what they do what they can. Um, and they might be looking for like real fraud too, right? Which is like, or full, more egregious fraud, which is people completely fabricating their situations. Do you think now the most common type of tax fraud is business lunches? <laughs> no, because I, I don't really get into that. Um, and this is another funny, again, I don't know, people will say, oh yeah, business lunches and pay for it. It's not necessarily reducing your taxes. No. Um, so I had somebody who they were a sole proprietor and they're like, oh yeah, my, my income shows low because, uh, or something. It was like, cause I, um, like I don't pay taxes cause I buy my lunch every day. And I was like, first of all, like five dollars a day shouldn't make that big of a difference. <laughs> Second of all, you're paying for that, but that's still like it's not coming off your taxable income because it's not an approved thing for a sole proprietor. Yeah. <laughs> that's so um, funny. I'm sorry, I'm like so laughing like, over you, but <laughs> yeah, I just think it's funny because like. You know, you can still pay for stuff, but it's not necessarily reducing your your tax liability. Um, oh my but, goodness! Did that person <laughs> have a lot of questions? <laughs> no, that. I, well, yeah, I don't want to say too much about that. No, person, like, and like, were, do you think someone told them that that was? Oh, CRA people tell approved? people stuff all the time, like, "Oh, that's a write off. You should do oh. this, Matt. That's a write off." Which I think we talked about before. Um, which again, I you know. I have a different perspective. I think people should be building businesses to generate long-term wealth. And it's about your wealth. It's not about short-term not pay the government because I've watched people, you know, people will just spend money on things they don't need to lower their tax bill, but it makes no sense at all to me. Like I used to see uh, at the bank, you know, people would buy like, you know, $50,000 worth of stuff they didn't need um, to like lower their taxes. And I'm like, it's just crazy. Greg, Greg here jokes to people like, well, if you really need that, I'll, you know, I'd be happy to charge you 50 grand <laughs> for your service and, uh, <laughs> you know, that'll lower your, your taxes, but why not pay the five grand <laughs> worth of taxes instead of, you know, $50,000 on something you don't need. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a different conversation from the um, sort of fraud. Uh, the other area I wanted to talk about is just in employment. Um, and I know we've had some of these conversations and um, I'm on the board of VCCS. And, you know, we were in a meeting a few weeks ago talking about, you know, most employers aren't aware of like Employment Standard Act types of basic they could easily be aware of some forget it some kind of hope that people don't notice um, so there's a lot of that type of fraud that that happens particularly around unpaid work um, we've talked about it before because you know it, we're influenced a lot by american media and in the states they have internships that are unpaid so you'll hear a lot of people like oh i have got this internship at this company and you might work there for, you know, six months, a year, completely unpaid. Uh, we don't have that in Canada. So in Canada, internships are only legal if it's for college credit with a college that has internships for that program. Um, 
so I've seen lots of people like, oh, I need an intern. I'll hire an intern. And I've ha- even seen students who like will get into sort of an unpaid internship that's completely illegal. Um, so you should not be accepting that unpaid work unless it's part of a college program. Um, I think before we've talked, I teach at Fleming College. Um, in the School of Business, Fleming does not have internships, but they do have applied projects. So sometimes students are doing, you know, some free labor as part of that applied project with a business. But there's also a whole process to document that and what that sort of scope is. I'm going to really dance around this story, but I had a conversation with someone last week that wanted to talk to me about building them a web page or like improving their look. And he was just giving me the situation of what they, they do already from a marketing perspective. And he told me they've got an intern doing some marketing work. And then later on in the conversation took very great pride in saying, I've got this intern that I've convinced to do free marketing for me. And it was just such a sour note to me. I didn't like it. And like, frankly, like not to, I'm not going to say anything too much more about it. There's multiple spelling errors on this very small website. (laughs) Yeah, it is. um, I find it just egregious in general. Um, You see it in other, um, Industries sometimes where they'll like, oh, come work for a trial run. And people will work for several days without getting paid to like audition for the job. And like my harsh, harsh advice is like build a better business and understand that, you know, you have to find labor, you have to train labor, you need to, and there's a cost for that. Not everyone's going to work out. That's kind of part of being a business owner and owning the means of production to be a business owner. Like you're the one that has to do that. It's not, usually it's kids, right? It's not some kid's job to for free fix your business or come in perfectly trained for something you need. Like that's your job as a business. People don't think that though. The businesses think that they want a turnkey employee. And they don't want to train them. They don't know how to train them. They want them a very certain way, which almost doesn't make sense because you're hiring someone because they have certain skills, but then you want them to act a completely different way and mold them the way that you want. And you've almost hired someone. You could hire anyone if that's the case, if you just want to like get them in line and have them follow orders. It's uh, and, And then also like with a turnkey employee, you're not getting someone that wants to work for you for $14 an hour or something. Like if you want, like you have a certain expectation of people that want to work a certain way, you got to pay them. What's an appropriate hourly wage now? I don't know. It's got to be 20 bucks. It's got to be 25 bucks. It's 30. Who knows? But it's not your $14 an hour or whatever the minimum wage is now. So sorry. I get like, that fires me up this conversation. (laughs) Yeah, it does too. Cause I think I, I joke with people and it's not really a joke, but it's like, do you want them to live indoors? (laughs) <laughs> like housing is so expensive and so hard to find in Kawartha Lakes. Like you have to be able to provide something that allows somebody to, you know, are they working one job or is it, you know, maybe it is designed for students at minimum wage, but usually then you maybe you're teaching them something. So people know, Hey, I'm going to go work there. Yeah, I won't make a lot of money, but they're so great at training and they're supportive through that, that it, it works, but you can't expect people to do things for free. Um, You can't pay them cash under the table. Like that's also a weird thing people do as well. Cause technically, you know, if I'm an owner and I'm sliding someone cash, you have to basically be committing fraud and not reporting that cash as income. Cause otherwise, if you're trying to write that off, it's your after-tax dollars. <laughs> yeah, your, that one like makes no, no sense, no <laughs> sense at all. So that you know is another thing that that bugs me. Um, the other cool thing. So when I was a student, I worked with, at VCCS um, one summer, 
And I remember an incident with, it was a kid who got hired to do a job that was dangerous, wasn't trained, got hurt. The guy fired him <laughs> and he was like hurt for the whole summer and couldn't work. Um, and you realize like this person didn't have WSIB. They weren't, they were trying not to even pay the kid for the time he worked. Um, but you are entitled as an employee, you know, if you work an hour, you are entitled to vacation pay for that hour. So there's just certain basics like that, that you have to recognize, you know, people are entitled to. Um, even I was reading the other day, there's some organizations now who are paying people for interviews because they want the best talent. They also realize people sometimes have to take a day off and not get paid from their job so they can come to an interview. So they now are, you know, their short list are getting paid an honorarium to come do that interview to just recognize the, the, the cost incurred for that. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. The best is, I feel I, we might be getting off track, but when you hear people, uh, part of the, the job interview is shadowing, which is just a fun way to have someone do your work near you for a day for free or what people probably end up doing for free. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you just to clarify is I know what VCCS is. Maybe oh, clarify yes. for anyone else that doesn't know what you're talking about. Yeah, so if it's a, if you're not familiar, VCCS is Victoria County Career Services. Um, it's an um, employment agency um, that provides supports to job seekers and employers in Victoria County, Kawartha Lakes. Um, so you can, if you are an employer looking to hire people, you definitely need to know about VCCS. They, you know, can set you up sometimes with. Uh, um, some employer incentives. They do have one actually where people will work for you for free, but the, they're through a program where they're getting paid to do that work through the government. So they, they get those like two week shadow periods or like, Hey, let's try this person out for a few weeks and pay their training. So that, you know, they, they work with that. They help you find people. Um, I've worked in several jobs where we found people through BCCS um, and if you're unemployed, you know, walk in there. Uh, they help you find jobs, meaningful work. Awesome. Very cool. And a great story for all of these, uh, you know, things you might be doing wrong or don't understand um, as a business. Um, and yeah, it may sound harsh, but like if you do own a business, it's your responsibility to not be committing fraud as much as possible, um, you know, re reporting your income, tracking things properly, you know, building a business where you can hire people without having to make them do free work for you to, uh, you know, in support your business. So is your accountant bookkeeper, if you've hired them responsible or liable at all for no. any fraud that you're committing, whether it's fake business lunches or any of that nonsense we jo joked and talked about. So there is some, um, uh, in assurance work. So if you are paying for an audit, there is some liability for them to spot and do certain things there. Sometimes egregious fraud, people are so good that they don't get caught right away. But your bookkeeper is not responsible. So many people blame their, oh, my bad bookkeeper. Or my bookkeeper was cooking the books. I hear that a lot. They are not responsible. You, the business owner, are responsible. Uh, you, the business owner, are responsible for what you report on your taxes and all of that. You hire a professional to help you, but they work with whatever you give them. So if you write up a bunch of fake receipts and hand it in, um, you know, they are, you know, they put them to put together what you do. If you forget some receipts, they, you know, put together what you, what you give them. So, um, it's very, uh, it's odd because it's, it's an industry too, that's based on volume. So not everyone's going to be like, Oh, here's all the things you're not doing properly unless you're paying for that sort of level of advice. And there are some different layers of assurance where you can get 
some of that look. You could ask someone to look into it to make sure things are proper. Uh, but when you own a business, you at the end of the day, you are responsible for basically everything. That's honestly, I think, very valuable information to have because I've heard that conversation, I'm sure, as you have as well. Well, while my accountant bookkeeper did something or I don't know, I'm sure it's probably trying to save face in a conversation, but that's it's not a real excuse. <laughs> that's yeah, not going to fly from CRA like that. Term. Yeah, and they, you can call yourself an accountant or bookkeeper without any sort of credentials. So, you know, you would need like a licensed public accountant doing an audit is a much different thing than a backyard person who calls himself an accountant who has just done some fake tax returns over and over for a long time. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's a whole spectrum and, you, you know, buyer has to beware and it's up to you as a business owner to know who you're dealing with. That's why you should listen to the Kawartha Small Business Podcast to uh, uncover some of these gems. Um, any final thoughts? No, don't commit fraud. I uh, don't think that uh, you can expense everything. And I'm sorry, we got off this topic quick and I'll try to be quick as well. But the thing about when people are like, oh, it's a business expense and they kind of like shrug it off. It's usually not business owners or it's usually business owners that don't know what they're talking about because it makes no sense. You still have to spend that money in the time and the moment. So it doesn't, yeah. the money is not, no, it, it, you still have to spend it. And then as you pointed out at one point, it doesn't mean you're getting a hundred percent of it back. I don't know what, what situation or what case are you getting a hundred percent of it back? That doesn't happen. So stop with that. Stop with the business write-off. It's like, oh, it's a business write-off. Like, shut up. That's not true. It's not a thing. We need to stop that myth. And- yeah. <laughs> awesome. I love that you're fired up about that. And, yeah. So uh, with that, that we were you, had, like, you had specific, you wanted to take it somewhere because we're getting off track. But I was like, no, nah, I got to get this off my chest. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, if you are committing fraud in your business or you just want us to like, hey, let's take a look at it. How do we build your business for you know profit? Um, we'd love to work with you. Uh, reach out uh, to Kawartha Small Business Podcast.ca. Uh, we'll help you start, grow, or recharge. Um, or just skip all that and send us an email to set it up at Kawartha Small Business Podcast.ca.